Mr. Camaroli should be rewarded. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there will be others joining us. My name is Dr. Fred Merchant. I'm the Dean of UPSM, and I'll be presenting uh, to you this afternoon along with uh, Dr. Sanjay Singh uh, and this session we call Chemistry. I think um, we'll have something interesting to offer you, and hopefully it will teach you to answer, ask questions later as we get towards the end. And uh, hopefully it will take you away from the normal patterns of uh, academic chemistry and a few places perhaps you might not ever uh, otherwise have a chance to visit. And uh, we'll try to make it straightforward. So I think we'll just get started. Um, there'll be some slides and I'll be showing those momentarily. And there'll be time at the end for questions. Uh, as I see your names appear on the screen, uh, I can't recognize everyone, but thank you for coming. And we appreciate your interest and would like to think that we can add something positive to your investment of time and energy and effort. And before getting started, I would invite all of you to continue reading, 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 whatever you do, never stop reading. Uh, there's a tendency to drift away from it, but please keep reading, reading, reading. Okay, Dr. Uh, Tim, can you put up the first slide? Today we're going to talk about chemistry. And I'll be directing it more towards biochemistry and physiologic chemistry referable to humans and illnesses. And we'll start off with, uh, I think, one of the most elegant and powerful document documents we've uh, have exposed to and have access to, and that's the periodic table of the elements. It is like a map, uh, a celestial map, uh, dealing with terrestrial us, and it has many things that, which make life uh, understandable and useful. And I'm assuming that most of you have seen the periodic table and have come to um, appreciate and wrestle with it a bit. The periodic table was uh, looked upon and thought about back in 1870, and it used to be called the Mendeleev table, but it's clearly uh, morphed into the periodic table. Hardly anyone refers to it uh, with that name anymore, Mendeleev. But I think if there was one document I'd like to have with me if I was going to Mars, I'd take a copy of the periodic table. Uh, I think it would be useful among other things. And I always like to have one sort of hanging around someplace because it always brings peace to uh, this perhaps potentially disorderly world. Periodic table is known as a chemical of elements, and uh, it basically has the elements on the table, as you are familiar with, uh, in a right to left, up and down order. The atomic number of the uh, table or the protons of the elements are in the horizontal rows numbered one through seven, uh, starting with hydrogen here and moving across, as I think you can see, to helium here. And I'm assuming that everyone has seen a periodic table, so this would make sense to you. Uh, Tim, there's a shadow in the middle of the screen, a microphone or something, maybe you can move it. That shadow on the screen. And it has a, a small um, guide for it, and it discusses the number of the percent of elements in humans. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen this. All the elements are given in the period, same number, electron shells as their period number. For example, um, the atom of hydrogen and helium, hydrogen here and helium across on the other side, uh, have one shell and the shells are then counted, as you can see on the left, one through seven, uh, with the uh, other elements in uh, another row. But the primary elements we'll be dealing with are in the main portion of the periodic table. <clears throat> um, the atoms of hydrogen and helium uh, have one electron shell while, for example, the elements of, or the atoms of potassium and calcium here have four electron shells. And that's four here, and that's one here. And these columns tend to put elements in their places by reactivity. And again, I'm not going through every detail with this. I'm sure that it's familiar to you. The, column, the elements on the left side, as we look at this table, but the ones to the left tend to be more reactive, and as we move to the right extreme of the table, they tend to be less reactive. Uh, here we have, as you can see, hydrogen through francium, 
and one of my favorites, which is cesium, which is associated with atomic clocks. And here on the right side, we have helium and the so-called noble elements, which are relatively non-reactive. And what I'll try to point out a little bit, because I know you're familiar with the layout of the table, is uh, something that may be of medical significance as we look at it, or industrial significance without trying to relate the periodic table to everything known to humanity. But I will point out a few things. For example, helium, uh, which is always attempting to escape, is a very important medically useful element because we use it for cooling magnets and um, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which is a non-radioactive way of looking inside the human body. And of course, we have the other elements uh, as they extend in the inferior direction. On the left side, we have <clears throat> the more active ele elements, hydrogen, <clears throat> uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and down through the rest of the group, and the lanthanides, which are constantly changing. This, I think, is going to be changed in, uh, because of uh, atomic uh, and physical a bombardment of particles. This is growing. Uh, you might uh, add to this later, uh, Dr. Sanjay, that uh, there's a perhaps a maximum, maybe 170, I think, theoretical elements that can be created, but that's open to discussion. Uh, but this is the basic periodic table. And from this, we will be looking at some of the important elements that we use referable to the table. Next slide. Okay, these are the elements that make up the human body. Uh, is there a way to move this uh, shadow in the movie in the middle, Tim? That one? Well, this is a pie diagram. And it shows the basic composition of the human mammals. Uh, it varies, obviously, with various animals and, plant and life forms on Earth. But this is the most important to us, the human body. Tim, can you remove that? Is there any way to move that in the middle? And you can see the color outline, the most uh, common element is oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and you can see on down nitrogen, calcium, and all others. And so with this in mind, if we look back at the periodic table, we don't have to go back to it. Oxygen clearly is extremely important. Uh, I point this out because your generation, the ones who are students, may be venturing to places outside the realm of the Earth, on, and even the solar system. So the idea of traveling to other places will in, incorporate great and vast and profound knowledge of how we function with respect to our biology. Next. Trace elements. <clears throat> and I put this on because, uh, Tim, is there any way to eliminate this in the middle? That... Uh, uh, the question... <laughs> No, Tim? Okay. <clears throat> okay, we'll look at these uh, elements, trace elements. <clears throat> you can see them by name, aluminum, boron, through copper, <clears throat> fluorine, iodine, manganese, molybdenum, excuse my voice, <clears throat> and, um, pardon me. Uh, sometimes people say, <clears throat> where, do you, where do you find any, oh, excuse me, my voice, just a moment. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> wow. Uh, where would you find reference to this? I put this elements found in vitamins, and they sell these elements to people, and most people have no idea what they do, what their names are. They, they're just told by the pharmacist, this is important for your health. And, of course, they tack on a nice price, and people take them. And as a physician, we have many patients who take vitamins uh, undirected, and sometimes they get overdoses of certain elements that appear here and can have problems. For example, iodine, uh, which some people are allergic to. <clears throat> sometimes they have uh, too much iron in them, cobalt, copper, and can create gastrointestinal problems with uh, food digestion. So looking at these as a physician and not just a scientist, it's important to know what people are taking why they're taking it, and how much they're taking. And it's easy for a physician or someone with limited knowledge or to just go online and say, just take this. 
and people take medications and chemicals without knowing their impact on their bodies and their health. Next. And this is just trace elements. This is a typical vitamin looking container. I put this in to bring some <clears throat> sense of the practical elements that we encounter. <clears throat> I also want to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, in addition to being chemicals that most people don't understand, they're usually written in, in print that no one can read. They're very small. <clears throat> And uh, they're directed by the pharmacist, and I was a pharmacist myself, so I know how easy it is to sell people expensive medications they may or may not need, or they take excess amounts of, or there may be some contraindication for taking this medication. You may say, what's this got to do with the periodic table? Okay, uh, but this is a part of everything in the periodic table is here. The periodic table is not just a lone standing record. It is indeed a part of how we function in our daily uh, lives, whether we're dealing with medical problems or just shopping and the food that we eat and the things that it's packaged in. And I think the more you know about the chemistry of the periodic table, the more and the better armed you will be to navigate through uh, the choices that you have. Next. <clears throat> The most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. Um, Tim, can we move, can we move that that um, in the middle? I don't know if you can. It keeps appearing. It's uh, a bit of a this. I don't think it's on the slide because it's clear from where I'm looking. It's on the slide. Oh, okay. I'm I'm sorry. I, I don't know where it's coming from. F uh, physically. Yeah. Uh, can you see that, Tim? Okay. It, it moved once and it disappeared. Okay. Uh, this is a list of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. I put this in for context because we live on this Earth and everything that we uh, encounter that we can uh, practically uh, stay healthy with and sustain ourselves comes from the Earth. So these are basic elemental uh, ele these are the basic elements as they occur in the Earth. And I put this on because most people don't think of it this way, but <laughs> Oh, what's going on here? Okay, thank you. But these are the elements that are from the periodic table that appear in um, Earth, the Earth's crust. Now, another thing about this, which I bring up with students is uh, <clears throat> all of these elements and all of these compounds find their way into our food chains and into uh, um, clothing and uh, elements that we use in our in our regular activities. So we have to be careful about what is being put into our environment. And many times we don't really know or we read labels and they're confusing. Next, Tim. <clears throat> the lanthanides, which I didn't mention more, most of lanthanides and actinides, uh, these are elements that have unfulfilled orbits and they tend to be uh, sometimes radioactive. And many of them are being added to by nuclear bombardment. Think the uh, reactors and um, the CERN uh, nuclear bombardment and physical activities that are going on to produce these. Uh, at the bottom, you see actinides. These are primarily used because of the radioactivity and they can power such devices as cardiac pacemakers. And in the space age industry, they will be used, I'm sure, otherwise. And this is just a repeat list of the lanthanides with their atomic numbers and many of them have been uh, given names because of where they were discovered. Uh, one day, maybe we'll have a Fiji uh, lanthanide or some other element that's named after one of us. Maybe Dr. Sanjay Singh will find something that we can call it the Sanjayam. Next. Actinides, uh, these are <clears throat> transitional metals and <clears throat> often are solid at room temperature. And uh, we've seen some of these uh, before, and one of the, this is not an actinide, but one of them that we don't use anymore in medicine, and that's mercury. It's not an actinide, it's on the periodic table, but we don't use that anymore because we know it has toxicity. So the age of having actinide type substances or mercury in thermometers and coming in contact with human existence is outdated. Next. And these are some of the names of the actinides, and uh, I won't belabor the point here, but they are a part of uh, the periodic table. And uh, although we don't use them and have perhaps uh, classrooms uh, 
uh, activities with them, they are part of our table. Uh, Curium, you might notice. Uh, Curium, named after uh, Madame uh, Curie. Uh, this is a very important element that's been used in radiation therapy and medicine. I'll try to point out a few of these. And the interesting about Curie, she's the only Nobel Prize winner that I think I'm aware of that has two in two different categories in physics and chemistry. So there's room uh, always for making discoveries. Next. Uh, I don't know how that got in. Next. Okay, most common elements in the Milky Way galaxy. Why am I putting this in? Because there's constant um, increasing information coming from this place we live in called the solar system. And so we're going to be looking at more and more references to uh, elements that are in the in our solar system and beyond it. I think of the Webb telescope that was just recently launched. I think of the DART project, which is going to disturb and try to redirect an asteroid. So we need to know and have some idea about what these elements are and if uh, some of these uh, uh, Asteroids may come and visit us, which they do from time to time. We need to know more about what they're bringing to uh, the Earth. And as a scientist and as a medical uh, individual, if all, any of you go into medicine, you may encounter or have to know about these because they may start to show up in the future, which is not far away. Next. Ten most abundant elements in the universe. Again, this is a reach. And uh, again, we see some of the same elements that we have on Earth. So we know that we are indeed a part of this vast universe uh, with hydrogen, helium, oxygen, etc. And all of these are the uh, blocks that build us as organisms. And your generation is going to be, I'm sure, visiting some of these extraterrestrial uh, places, and so you will have to know about the chemistry of where we as a species may be going or what may be visiting us by uh, people, astronauts returning uh, to the Earth. Next. Um, these are just, this is just put in to bring forth the uh, number of the names of the elements and how they appear on the periodic table. And I know this is familiar to you and I have a little uh, project at the end of the lecture, which I'll uh, sort out with you next. Um, Tim, I think something's missing in my slides. This, uh, uh, next. Um, next, uh, next, I think this is, okay. Uh, there are a couple of things that were kind of missed here, I think. Um, what I, what I want to show you here are some commonly used healthcare products that involve, um, the periodic table and how we are using it and how vitally important all the chemistry that's represented by the periodic table is to all of us. Uh, these are common devices and uh, materials that we use in medicine. I sh I'm sure that you've seen them before, but when I have students, I'll ask them, you know, what is, what is, what do these things come from? How are they made and why are they made? And, uh, are there any, any elements about them that we should be aware of that may propose a health risk or danger to any of us? Uh, let's look at this tray in the upper left. It looks like uh, some shiny uh, elements, or sh I should say shiny uh, equipment. And usually I ask uh, my students, what do you think this is made of? And so I might ask uh, and pose this question to the audience. Uh, I don't know if they can answer now, but what do you think these shiny objects are made of? Is there any way for them to answer, Tim? No? Okay. Well, these are, are made of basically stainless steel. And all of us use products uh, like this uh, and products made from steel. My next question for my students usually is, what is steel? And wh what does that mean? And why is it so important that we know about it? First of all, it has to be made from earth resources. And it's basically made of iron. But we know that iron has a, a, a tendency and a propensity for connecting with oxygen very, very readily. So 
iron rusts, and it's not a very good product to use uh, for medical instruments. However, if we make this into steel, and we make the steel by taking iron, and obviously with heat and uh, some other elements, and we combine it with carbon. And if we make carbon with iron, we have steel. But steel also has its uh, limitations because it uh, is having to be exposed to chemicals and temperature changes in the hospital environment. So we try to use stainless steel. And stainless steel is a much higher grade of steel from iron, and it lasts longer. We can expose it to chemicals. We can put it in an autoclave repeatedly. And it's more expensive because we have to add chrome to it in addition to um, carbon to make stainless steel. And the stainless steel is a very useful product and it has great longevity and can be uh, a very good investment. Here we have some of the same uh, items. We have a stainless steel, what's called a kidney basin. It's shaped uh, like a human kidney and it fits easily. It doesn't go into the kidney, but it fits near patients. And we have some other instruments and we have a variety of different non-metallic metallic materials here and here, hats and here. And I know because of COVID, all of us are familiar with putting masks on uh, or various uh, protective gear around our oral and uh, nasal airway entries. And we have to be careful about what these are made of. And as you look at this, there's basically no way to intuit exactly what it's made of unless it has a label. All of these products come from the periodic table. They have their basis uh, and formation and the industry that's used to make them, it comes from the periodic table. And we must be certain uh, that it's safe for all of us to use. As I look around, I see people with various masks and I don't know where they come from and who made them, but some of them may not be uh, particularly good for, for someone, for example, who has emphysema or who has asthma, which is a very common disease in our society and in the world at large. So all of these things do have a potential impact on how we function in our normal daily activities, irrespective of the periodic table, because they all came from the periodic table. Next. Again, uh, we see a scene from the operating theater. Notice special garments that we're wearing, special hats, the material that we're using to do the particular surgery. There's a person giving anesthesia. We have this green towel on the, on the uh, stand with the instruments. All of these things have their origin in the periodic table, no doubt about it, including the colors and dyes that are used to make things visible to us. All of these have to be reused. Sometimes we have throwaways. For example, some of these gowns are made of a paper type material and we can dispose of it. But when we dispose of it, how do we do that? How do we make something go away without affecting our environment and without including it in somehow uh, reacting with elements from the periodic table. Again, we have on the other side of the image, we have plastic goods, uh, protective gear for the staff. We have common items, which most people don't pay attention to, paper towels. And then I asked my students, who invented toilet paper? Where does that come from? Because it wasn't always here. And all these things we take for granted, we should be very astutely aware of their origin how they're made, where they come from, and where they go after we use them. Uh, we have gloves. What do we do with all this when it's finished? How do we dispose of it in a manner that's safe for us? I know this is not about an environmental uh, exercise, but you cannot separate the periodic table and whatever we do from this planet on which we live. So all of these things are very nice for us to use, but we have to think about how we can manage what we do with them afterwards. Next. These are clinical situations, and I hope they don't disturb anyone. Uh, here on the uh, upper right or upper left, and again, um, I'm showing you these because they indirectly involve the periodic table. So when you look at the periodic table, it is not just a group of numbers and symbols in a book, on a paper, that is just used to give you a problem. It's that they are the reality of how we deal with, with problems in our, in, our, in this instance, medicine. Here we have a, an inhaler. 
Uh, these are used by asthmatics uh, commonly. All this material comes from the periodic table. There's no question about it. However, with this particular device, there is clearly on the label, it doesn't say, oh, guess what? This was made from items on the periodic table. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that on anything that we, that we consume or utilize. But on this particular device, it says the following, do not dispose of in a fire or hot environment. You must dispose of properly. It never tells you exactly what that means. You should dig a hole and bury it. So one uh, instance we encountered was a person who was an asthmatic, uh, left it, and it wasn't being used. And, of course, a curious 10-year-old found it, and there was a fire burning. And the 10-year-old uh, took it and threw this uh, atomizer into the fire, and it immediately exploded and uh, pinned and hit this uh, child and made a hole in his abdomen, which required surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So I show you this to bring the periodic table away from just a dry a group of symbols on paper, but they do mean something. This clearly is a person who has encountered this device, which is a fishing hook, and it's gone and penetrated his eye, the anterior chamber of the eye, and it has this uh, plastic material attached to it. This hook uh, is made of some kind of metal. We even find them that are made of aluminum. We find them made of steel, of stainless steel, a variety of different things uh, that may or may not be useful or helpful in this particular case. So in this case, the periodic table has done something or the byproduct of the periodic table has done something which is potentially dangerous and threatening to this person's vision. Again, uh, this is made from items on the periodic table, but it's made by humans who decided to do this with the items on the periodic table, the elements. This one is clearly an x-ray. I think everybody can recognize that. And um, most people have no idea where the x-ray film comes from, how we make it. Uh, what do we do with it after it's used? Do we burn it? Do we bury it? Uh, do we just collect it forever? And what about the x-rays uh, affecting this patient? What is uh, safe for the patient? How do x-rays interact with the elements on the periodic table? Uh, are they able to knock a loose protons? Uh, do they invade the nucleus? There are other issues associated with getting x-rays other than having the x-ray. Next. And I think this is the last slide. This is the um, difference between life and death. And this shows an intravenous cannula. And you're seeing it close up. Uh, this person's hand. I hope you can appreciate that. This is the cannula. And some of you, I'm sure, have seen this or maybe even personally have had one. And I show you this because it, it's, it's, it's a complicated device. It looks simple, but it's a complicated device. As you can see, it has a clear plastic looking tube. It has this rubberized material. Uh, we used to use natural rubber, but most of this is synthetic and it's connected to a plastic hub. And inside the plastic hub, there's another plastic tube that goes to the vein. There was a piece of stainless steel that was poked into the vein. It's been disposed of, and now we have the plastic tube in the person's vein. Each one of these uh, parts of this uh, device are pretty high tech. Uh, However, device. yes. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'll continue. Um, in any event, what I was uh, saying was these devices are are glued together, they're bound together. This plastic tube is bound to this, this is bound to this, and this is bound to another plastic tube which goes into the vein. So there are a number of different connections. If uh, this first portion of the plastic tube in the vein is disconnected accidentally or by manufacturing defect, it can go inside the vein and inside the person's circulation, and that has happened. When something like that occurs, we have to obviously find the, the fault with it, and then take all of these devices, which are usually imported. In fact, I know they're imported. We don't make them in Fiji. And go through all the lots and find out why that happened. So there's much more than we look at all these beautiful symbols. We put them together. We do things with them. We make these products. And then we're all happy with what we do. But sometimes there, there are complications with them. And when I show you this, I want you to think back to the first slide, which was 
our friend the periodic table and how we're able to use those chemicals to make these devices, but they also have potential for side, side effects or untoward uh, reactions. Next. Okay, why is all this important? It's important um, not because you just have to take an exam or you want to hear my voice or you didn't have anything else to do today. It's important because it involves this word, science. And science is what allows us to have this idea of a periodic table and, of course, to do what we're doing now, which is to conduct this lecture. And science is a, is a word that's often used, but most of the times people don't define it. They just say it's science. It's science fiction. It's science this, it's science that. But science is basically a philosophy of making observations and discoveries and using the best available methods to measure to scrutinize these measurements, and more importantly, to invite criticism, to invite others to look at these and see if they make sense or if they can be duplicated. And then we can accept this, whether we like it or not, if two plus two is four, that's the way the rules are. And so science is a very powerful tool, one of the most powerful tools that we have for interacting and making the items on the periodic table come to the reality of life that we use in what we call modern uh, human existence. Knowledge, very much uh, something that all of us should acquire. And I'm going to say something that may rankle some of you, but what I find today, and it has nothing to do with uh, me personally, is most people uh, are not reading books anymore, so they get the superficial portion of whatever it is, but the in-depth knowledge is lacking and I encourage all of you to embrace books and to try and read the depth that's necessary to understand, uh, not necessarily what the patient's telling you, but what the patient's telling you and what it means to you and, for, and with respect to that patient. Truth with patients, we always have to be truthful with them. Truth with facts, we try to deal with facts. All of you I know are going to be taking exams and you have to be scrutinized and you have to be monitored and someone has to measure your progress and your performance. And we have to do that always because that's the way life works and it's important. Efficacy, are these things important? Will they make a difference in anyone's life or existence? How do we avoid danger? Uh, being honest and in medicine, we have something that we all swear to and we take an oath of Hippocrates and we say we will do things because they're right not just because they're okay, but because they're right, and we will respect our patients, we respect all of you. And trust, do you trust what I'm telling you is the truth? You can go and look it up, and I invite you to do that. And we also have this as part of our uh, credo as medical scientists, first do no harm. If, <clears throat> if we can't make it better, maybe we should consider not doing it, so we first do no harm. And lastly, think airplanes, safety, safety, safety. Why am I putting this in? Because whatever your direction and your science uh, interests, you may one day be a passenger on a plane. Planes are very complex machines. We know that uh, because we have COVID now, everybody's happy that airplanes are flying, they're blind. people are coming, traveling, etc. But to know how, to, how these work and how does this come in how does a periodic table come into play with these uh, devices? It's a major part of how they function. And so what I want to say by summarizing is when we talk and we go back to the periodic table, Tim, can you go back to slide one? <clears throat> and we, or wherever it is, yeah. We look at this uh, picture and we see what it represents all of those slides that I showed you are a product of the ingenuity that I know is within you to make those things realities because of our ability as humans and as the dominant species on our planet to take these symbols and to convert them into useful, productive uh, guides to what we would call the cosmos or our universe. So I invite you, all of you to study it feel comfortable with it, uh, give yourself problems with it. If you're studying with someone, make up problems, see how they fit, but try and understand this book that you're looking at, this portrait that you're looking at, and how powerful it is 
and what a difference it makes to how we look and how we can use and develop science to our benefit. Because one day we will have to somehow, I believe, leave our planet Earth and go and explore some other worlds. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a business doing pleasure with each and every one of you. It's not has nothing to do with business. And I appreciate your time and attention. And uh, Tim, if we have any time for a question or two, I'll be happy to do that. And thanks a lot for your, your attention. Thank you. Yes, Sanjay, thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Fred, uh, for the vast coverage on, uh, on the periodic table and its importance in terms of pharmacology and uh, in the biochemistry. Okay, uh, students, uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, we'll be having a look at some of the, the problem solving questions uh, that is based on EF13 uh, syllabus. Okay, but uh, I know you have been very much affected by the pandemic, so you must be getting a lot of questions, uh, particularly on calculations, uh, such as calculations, and, and many more. But with the time limitation, I won't be able to cover all of those. So actually, I brought in 10 questions, and let me see how many questions we can cover it today. And if there is a, a time, if we can go beyond 4.30, then it's fine. Then we can actually cover it. Okay, but uh, if there are concerns, you can always email me. I've already uh, placed my email address on the chat box. You can always email me and uh, I can respond to your questions later on. So thank you for your patience. So let me first share my screen. <clears throat> thank you very much. And good luck to everyone. Thank you, sir. You're entirely welcome. You're gonna be doing the next session, correct? This is Dr. Singh. You're doing a next session, correct? Yes, yeah. Okay, will you stay on this uh, on this channel? Okay. Got it. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tim. I hope everybody is able to see the screen. Uh, team, are you going to see the screen? Yes? Okay, so the first, the first question is based on, the, I suppose, question one and question two, uh, whereby we're going to calculate the average atomic weight of magnesium, and you are actually provided the, the three isotopic combinations. Uh, the isotopic for magnesium at 24 is 23.985 with a percentage of 78.7, with magnesium 25, the atomic of the real atomic weight is actually 24.96 with 10.13 percent and a magnesium 26 actual atomic weight with 25.93 and percentage is 11.17 so for these ones we need to calculate the average atomic weight now to do that okay okay so we will do the calculation and uh, uh, what is the formula? Can anyone still recall the formula? So we find the average weight. Oh, just hold on. Just, just hold on. Let me see. Just find the pen first. Okay, so okay, we begin the calculation. So actually, if you want to do that, so you find the average atomic weight. Okay, so average atomic weight. Okay, so what is the formula for that? Anyone still recalls? 
is equal to is the sum of percentage of events, okay, multiplied by the year of the ISO 2 divided by 100. So let me write it down. Uh, there's something wrong with the stylus. Okay, just hold on. So that's percentage abundance. Okay. Percentage abundance multiplied by the year of the isotope. Use the bracket and that is divided by 100. Okay, so you already got your percentage of evidence. Last one is 78.7. That's the percentage of evidence over here. That is to be multiplied by 23.985 over 100. And you add it. It's a 10.13% over 100 multiplied by 24.986. And the 82, 11.17 over 100 multiplied by 25.983. So that is the things that you have to do there. Okay, so that's the first one. 78.7 over 100. Okay, and then you multiply by 23.985. That's the first part, and you add it to 10.13, that's a percentage here. So 10.13, and that is out of 100%, multiplied by the percentage abundance is 24.96. Okay, and then close the breaker. And then you also need to add over here the third one that's 11.17. 11.17 out of 100. Okay, and then you multiply by 25.983. So if you use your calculator, you should be able to get your percentage of this, and you should be able to get 24.310. So that's the answer for the first part of the question. You can also try this question later on as well. So just write down the answer on the side here. That's 24, okay, 24.310. So you can use the calculator to find the value for that. So this question is quite a simple question where you just need to find the average of the weight whereby you're taking the percentage of this over the 100 multiply by the atomic weight and then you're going to add all those to get the value of 24.310. Any questions anyone? Is it fine? All good sir. Okay, there are no questions. Then we're going to look into the question number two. Okay, the question number two is also based on isotopes uh, but over here uh, we are not going to find the average atomic weight, but instead you're going to find what is the percent of natural carbon, the so isotopic carbon 13, whereby the total atomic weight of carbon 12 here is 12.00. Okay, and uh, look at the natural carbon. The natural carbon has the weight of 12.0111, and uh, using that, you also need to find the isotopic of uh, carbon 13, which has the atomic weight of 13.0035. Okay, so to do this kind of the question, okay, what we need to do, we need to do some assumptions, okay? So the first assumption is that we need to start with that. Uh, we need to select the X. We do not know what is the X, okay? The X is actually the percentage abundance of carbon 13. So your X is is equals to percentage abundance of carbon 13. Okay, 
So that's your carbon 13. Okay, that's what you want to find it out. Okay, what about your carbon 12 then? What is the percentage abundance of your carbon 12? So your percentage abundance of a carbon 12 would be, would be the total percent, the total percent is 100% minus the percentage abundance of your carbon 13, that is your X. So that's how you have to start the problem. First, letting to know that X is the percentage abundance of carbon 13. And if you want to find the percentage of carbon 12, then the total percentage minus the percentage of carbon 13 that's your x. Okay, so you're going to use the same formula as you used in the uh, question number one. Okay, so your average atomic weight. Okay, average atomic weight. I just use the short form. Okay, is equals to sum of percentage abundance. Okay, sum of percentage abundance. Okay, and this is to be multiplied by the IR. Okay, that's the isotopic mass. So I just say isotopic, I just use a short form, isotopic mass. Okay, and divided by, okay, so, okay, yeah, that, that's the formula you can do. So average atomic weight is equal to sum of percentage abundance, okay, multiplied by isotopic mass. So what is the atomic weight given? Okay, you can define where is the atomic weight. This is the atomic weight of the natural carbon and that's a 12.011. So that's what I write it out here. 12.011. Okay, and what is the percentage abundance of your carbon 13? Yes, you got over here. Percentage abundance of carbon 13 is 13.00335. We get it from here. Okay, so that's your 13. Okay, 0.00335. And this is actually x, so this is multiplied by x. Okay, and then we're going to add it. Add it to carbon 12. Okay, what is the abundance of carbon 12? Uh, you've got the abundance of carbon 12 as 12.00 here. So that's the 12. This one wrong. 12.00, okay, and what is the abundance? 100 minus x, so into 200 minus x. And from over here, it's just a math problem. You just need to solve for the x, okay? So minus x here, okay? And how of it is actually divided by 100, okay? So divide by 100. And then you solve for the x. So firstly, what you're going to do, you're going to multiply by 100 both the sides. So you can cancel the 100 over here. And you multiply 12.0111 with 100 this side. And then you try to solve for the x. Can everyone try that? And find what is the value of the x then? I'll just give you two minutes. So let's see. So quite a simple question. Quite a simple math problem over here. Everyone should be able to... Who is not problem here, right? Okay, has anyone done a question then? Has, has anyone done on the value of x? So 
So what is the value of x then? Let's see the value of x. Okay, if you write it down, the value of x here. So the value of x is equal to? Yes, anyone? It's one point. Have you got this? 1.11%. One so that's the value of x. So that's the value for your carbon 13. So this x is zero carbon 13 over here. Okay, so we have been solving for x. So the value for the x, that's the isotopic percentage for your carbon 13 comes to 1.11%. If you solve for the x according to the situation, then you can find the percentage abundance of the carbon. Okay, very simple. That's your 100 minus x and the value of x is 1.11. So the percentage abundance for the carbon would be then 100 minus 1.11 will give you the percentage of 98.89. So that is going to give you the percentage of carbon 12. Any questions on your question number two? Is it fine? No questions? Okay, if you have the questions, you can always email me then. Okay, then we're going to move on to the next question. That's your question number three. Okay, look at this particular question. This is based on quantum numbers. <clears throat> okay, quite a simple question. It's a phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus is a group five element, so it belongs to group five. So that means it contains five valence electrons. That's why it's grouped into group five of the periodic table. Okay, the first thing to do is to fill in the orbital diagram, okay, for the phosphorus atom. And you also need to state which rule is being applied for filling in the orbital diagram. And then you need to write down a set of four quantum numbers, okay, for the electron in 3p orbital of the phosphorus. So quite a simple question, not very difficult, okay. And this is the order of filling the electrons, remember that. Okay, this is the lowest level, 1s. 1s has got one orbit, which can accommodate maximum of two electrons. Remember that a orbit will have maximum of two electrons, one pointing upwards, that's your positive half for clockwise rotation, and the other one will be spinning anti-clockwise that is pointing downwards. So that's 1s with two electrons, 2s again with two electrons, and then if you look at 2p, okay, 2p has got uh, three orbitals, and these three orbitals are uh, degenerate orbitals, we call degenerate meaning that uh, the uh, electrons in these three orbitals are of equal energy. So for example, if you look at this, this is your 2px. Okay. So that's your 2px. This is your 2py. Now what does x and y signify over here? This is your 2pz. Okay, still remember? This is just the orientations of the electrons in the different planes. Over here, the electrons are oriented in the x-axis. So over here, the electrons are oriented in the y-axis. And over here, that's your 2py. Electrons are oriented, oriented in the z-plane. So for example, if you look at the plane over here, this is x, okay? Uh, this is Y. These are the different planes, okay, or the different axes, and this is the Z. And it's a P orbital, okay. So what is the shape of the P orbital? Yes. Anyone recalls? S is a spherical, okay. P is a. Anyone recalls what is P? Okay, so it's like a 
number eight isn't that so it is in x axis so this is the x axis so that is upper lobe and this is the lower lobe of your x i mean the the electrons oriented in the x plane if it is like 2py then this lobe would be along your y plane or if it's like a 2pz then this lobe would be along your z plane so this actually signifies the orientation of electrons in space okay so we look at phosphorus and the atomic number for phosphorus is 15 okay so we fill in the electrons and you fill in the lowest energy first and once you completely fill in the lowest energy then we move on to the next highest so this is the lowest and this is the highest energy so you fill in the electrons so that's one and two electrons so the 1s is completely filled then we move on to the next energy level again remember that 2s with one orbit has a maximum of two electrons. Okay, and how are we filling the electrons? That's the question over here. We fill in the electrons according to? off bow principle. off bow principle, very good. So that's the off bow principle. What does off bow principle suggest? That once we fill in the lowest energy, only then we can move on to the next highest energy. Okay, so once we fill in the 2s, then we fill in the 2p. And if you look at the 2p, 2p has got three gendered orbitals, 2px, 2py, and 2pz. And how we fill in the electrons for these d gendered orbitals? Anyone recalls? For this d gendered orbital, how we fill in the electrons according to which rule? Hans rule. Okay, we fill in according to the Hans rule. We fill one electron here. Then we're not going to fill in the second electron over here is to minimize repulsion effects. So we fill one electron in 2px, then in order to minimize repulsions, we move to 2py. And then we move on to 2pz. Once it's completely filled, then we can pair up. That's your fourth. Okay. That's your fifth. And that's your sixth. So that's done. Completely filled. And then we move to 3s. Okay. With two electrons. Okay. And then you count how many electrons are left. So that's two, four, that's six, eight, ten, twelve, and you're left with three electrons. So you fill in the electrons according to the answer, three px. This is three py, and this is your three pz. Okay, so that's done. So that's how we fill in the electrons according to the of Bowes principle in consideration to the Hans rule as well. Okay, now the next question here. We need to write down the set of four quantum numbers for the electron in 3p, but it does not really signify whether it is 3py, 3px, or it is 3pz. Okay, so we can note it down here. We can say this is your 3px. This is your 3py. And this is your 3pz. But what we can do for this in this particular case, we can fill it for 3py, 3px, and 3pz as well. So if we write down the four quantum numbers, and what are the four quantum numbers? Your n, the principal quantum number. Then comes your secondary quantum number, that's your L. Then comes your Magnetic ML. quantum number, ML. And then you have your very important one, and that's your spin ML. quantum number, MS. Very good. Okay, so what we will do, we can write down the four quantum numbers for all of those so that you recall it. Oops. Okay, so we write it down for our uh, 3px here. Px. Then we can write for 3py. 
and then you can write down for free to z. <coughs> okay. So what is the principal quantum number over here? Yes? Three. It's already three, yes. It's already shown here. The number in front here, can you see? It's like three P. So this three, this three signifies the main shell. This is the main shell, main energy level in the periodic table. Remember that there are seven main energy levels in the periodic table. And the one that is shown here is the third one. So for over here, for the first one, three PX, your n is equals to three. And what is the value of your L here? One. The secondary quantum number. Yes? What's the value for your one. L here? One. 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 How do you know that? Why you say one? When L is equals to zero, if you still recall, when L is equals S. to zero, it's a S. S subshell. Very good. And when L is equals to one, it's a P subshell. Yes, very good. And when L is equals to two, it's a D subshell. D subshell. L is equals to three, it's F and so forth. So in this case, the L is equals to uh, one here, since it is a three P, so L is equals to one. Now, what is the value for ML here then? For three P X. Remember that your ML, okay? If you look at your ML, the ML is ranging from minus L uh, to zero and one and positive L. Okay, so these are the L values. Okay, so minus L, zero, positive L. And what is the value for L? L is one. So that means minus L is what is the value of L? One. And then you have zero. Following everyone? And then this is your first one. Maybe some of you still confused. Okay, how we get to ML? ML is actually, this is not one, this is L, okay? So minus L to zero to positive L. And what is the value of L? L is equals to one here. You can see, so that is your minus one, that's your zero, positive one. So for three PX, your, your ML value is minus one. Okay, so that's your minus one. And what's your MS? It is positive half. half. You see this pointing. Okay, it is pointing upwards. Okay, so it's a clockwise direction. Okay, so similarly you can feel it for your three P Y. Okay, so for for three P again, you can see for so three P Y actually your N and L values will be the same, isn't it? So the principal quantum number is three, and your it's a P subshell here again. So it's it's one actually. And what is the value for ML? ML becomes zero okay and it's pointing upwards so this is positive half okay so in the similar manner you can do the last one okay again this is 3p so that's your three here for n l is equals to one your ml would be positive one you need to signify positive okay or your solution would be wrong then so positive one and it is pointing upwards, so this is positive half, okay? So that's how you actually solve the questions on these quantum numbers. But if the question is specifically asking for 3px or 3z, then you should be actually providing only those. But for, for these ones over here, we have actually discussed for 3py, 3px, and 3z, okay? Any questions, anyone? No, sir. That's fine. <laughs> okay, then we look at one of the questions on gases. Okay, this is a calculation on gases. And over here to calculate the temperature uh, for the 0 0.2 gram sample of oxygen O2 gas containing a volume of 100 cm cube container uh, at a given pressure of 150.3 kilo pascals. Okay, so this question is based on gas laws. 
Okay, and you have to use the concept of the gas law to solve this particular question. And uh, which gas law you're going to use it? If you still recall, what do you see gas law going to use it? Yeah, and one? Forgotten? Very important gas law. Your PV is equals to NRT. Okay, your PV is equals to NRT. Your P is the pressure, V is the volume, and is the number of moles, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. And you want to make your temperature the subject, so you can make your T the subject. Okay. And then you can solve for it. But before you make your TV subject, maybe you have to find the number of moles first. Okay. So let's see. Can you just say this? Give you two minutes. Let's see. You can find the number of moles now. The mass is provided to you 0 0.2 grams. And it is a molecular oxygen. So that's O2. Okay. So what is MR of oxygen? It is 16 grams per mole, and you have the two of those, and it's a biomolecular, you can see. So that's a 16 plus 16 will give you 32 grams per mole. So first of all, find the number of moles, you know, N, okay, is equals to mass over molar mass. Okay, the mass given is 0 0.2 grams. Over the molar mass is 32. You still recall 32. How you get your 32? Because one of the oxygen is 16, and there are two of the oxygen. So 16 plus 16 giving you 32 grams per mole. Okay. And then you just use your calculator. So remember that the grams and the grams is going to cancel off. So you get your number of moles, and you get 6.25. Okay. If you use your calculator. You get a 6.25 to the power of minus 3 moles. Okay, so that's your number of moles. So that's done. That's the first part. Then using this, you make your temperature the subject of the formula. So your temperature is equals to EV. It's pressure into volume divided by NR. Okay, and then it's quite simple from here. You can solve it from here. Okay, so let's see. The pressure is uh, 150. So that's 150.3. And the unit to carry the unit, that's a kilopascals. The units are also very important as well. So that's 150.3 kilopascals into the volume. Make sure if you see the units over here, this is a standard unit in kilopascals. That means you need to change the volume from centimeter cube into liters. Okay, so that's going to give you 0 0.1 liter. Do not make a mistake. The units are also very important. So you're going to use the standard units over here. Okay, if you're not going to convert it, then you're going to get a incorrect answer then. Okay, and then you divide by the number of moles you got it. That's a 6.25 to the power of minus 3. Moles multiplied by a gas constant. The gas constant is 8.314. These values won't be given to you. We need to recall these values, okay, for the gas flows, particularly for the values for the R. Okay, so that's your joules per Kelvin mole. You also need to know the units so that you can cancel the units and get the standard unit at the end. Okay, 
so that's done there okay so now you can cancel some of the units you can cancel the mole there you can cancel the mole what else we can cancel you cannot cancel any other thing over here okay so let's see so what you get here over here if you multiply these two if you multiply these two you get 15.03 and what is the unit kilopascals into liters okay now if you look at the conversion okay one kilopascal let's show you the conversion It's one kilopascal liter. Okay, let me write it again. Like one. Kilo Pascal into liter is same as one joule. So that's a very important conversion you should be known. Okay, so one kilo Pascal liter is same as one joule. So that means kilo Pascal into liter is same as joules over here. Okay. And then you divide by this over here. So 6.25 multiplied by 8.314. So this gives you 0 0.005. 0 0.05. And it's like a long answer in the calculator. Okay. You can continue writing. And then it's like joule. So what is left of your joule per Kelvin? So that's left with joule per Kelvin. You can see. The Kelvin, and the Kelvin is going to cancel off, and that is your final answer. This is 289. 289.2 Kelvin. So that's the answer. That's the importance. To, that's the importance of using or calculating using these uh, units so that you are actually aware that whether the unit is in degree Celsius. Or it is actually in Kelvin, and you have done the conversions over here, done these calculations, and you found it out that your calculation, the final answer, is actually in Kelvin. I hope this is clear. Okay, everyone. Yes, sir. So, so what's okay. your final answer? That's two eighty nine point two. Oh, okay. Sir, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. So that's a question four. Again, the question number five is on gases. I hope you're finding the questions on gases a bit more difficult. Okay, let's see. Let's see this question. You got you're provided with one gram of gas, and that is occupying 300 mils at a temperature of 25 with a pressure of 99 kilopascals. And using that, you're going to find the number of moles, and also you're going to find the molecular mass as well. So look at the question. Okay, not a very difficult question. You can do again use the, the gas laws. Just try to use a gas laws. Use P is equals to an RT. Firstly, try to find the number of moles. Make the number of moles the subject of the formula test. Once you find the number of moles, okay, then you can find the molecule, molecular mass. <coughs> okay, so use P is equals to an RT then. Okay, and you can make your number of moles, subject of the formula. So that's a PV. Okay, your PV over RT. Morning, everyone. Okay, so over here, and then you can to put in the values then. So your pressure is over here, 99 kilopascals.
Okay. And then you have your the volume. What's the volume there? 300 mils. So convert the mils into liters divided by 1000. So you get 0 0.3 liters then. Okay, and then divide by R. You know the very <coughs> so for that. That's 8.314. That's a joule per Kelvin mole. So that's R. And then the temperature. The temperature must begin. Kelvin, how do you know in Kelvin? Because you're using the unit Kelvin here. So that means. 273 plus 25. So this gives you 298 Kelvin. I hope everyone is following that. And you still recalling those. Okay, and then we saw from here then. <coughs> so it's very simple here then. So has anyone calculated the value for the number of moles? Can you use the moles. <laughs> <coughs> okay, zero point zero <coughs> zero point zero one two moles. Very good. You must have used the conversion factor as well, whereby <coughs> one <coughs> <coughs> sorry for that. So by one kilopascal equal <coughs> the liter is equal to <laughs> One joule, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so I found the number of moles. Then now you can find the molecular mass. Okay, I give you, <laughs> I give you <laughs> two minutes. Let's see. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so you find the molecular mass. So you use n is equals to mass over molar mass. <coughs> and then you can make your molar mass the subject of the <laughs> formula. Yes, so this equals to a mass over the number of moles. So it's very simple. And we can solve from here. So the mass given is one gram. That's one gram. Okay, over the molar mass. Yes. Oh, sorry, the number of moles and the number of moles is 0 0.012. So 0 0.012. So long. So that's the number of moles. Okay, and then you can just use the calculator. What's the value getting? 83.4, isn't that? Yes, sir. Okay, 83.4. The unit is gram per mole. 
Okay. So that solves the question number five on gases. That's fine. Okay, then I've seen in a syllabus you're also covering the solubility product as well. So that's your question number six. Whereby you're going to calculate the KSP of calcium chloride at a temperature of 25 with a given volume of one liter in pure water. Okay, and look at the number of moles of calcium chloride, that's 2.3 to the power of minus four moles. <coughs> okay, so look at the question. How you to find the value for KSP? What is the first thing to do? The first thing to do is to find the concentration of your calcium chloride, and then you need to write down the dissociation equation. Okay, and then you can find the concentration of your calcium ions, chloride ions. Okay, and then you need to put in the KSP expression, okay, to find the value for the KSP. Okay, so remember that this is dissolved in one liter cube, that means in one liter of water. Decimeter cube is same as one liter. Okay, this is the number of moles. Okay, so moles over the liter will give you the concentration. So what is the concentration of your CAF2 then? So you find the concentration of CAF2 first. That's the calcium fluoride. This is the symbol for the concentration, the square bracket is equals to number of moles over liters. So the number of moles is given to you as 2.3 to the power of minus 4. So that's the number of moles. Okay, so that's the number of moles uh, over one liter. That is one liter cube. So that's the concentration. That's a 2.3 times 10 to the power minus 4 moles per liter. Or we can say the molar concentration. That's the molarity that is symbolized with capital lamp. We can either say mole per liter, or we can say molarity. This is actually more common. Okay, then the next step is to write down the dissociation equation for the calcium fluoride. So CAF2, remember that it's a sparingly soluble salt. Okay, so that's a solid. Remember that is sparingly soluble salts are the salts which are this is leading to a very small percentage, so therefore the reaction is reversible. So it dissociates to give you calcium ions, CA2 plus aqueous. <coughs> okay. Plus two right ions, that's F minus. And this is also aqueous as well not gaseous but this is in the aqueous state and they need to balance equation so one calcium one calcium two fluoro so over here is on one so you place two <coughs> now look at the ratio it's one mole so it's is it necessary mole. to mention the state yes yeah the states are very important because over here when you see this is a sparingly soluble salt so it is Solid, it is not dissolved in the water. I have known that you are dissolving in the pure water. So, once you are dissolving in the pure water, 
Okay, the salt is going to dissolve, but it is going to dissolve to a small extent. So once it dissolves, the bond between calcium chloride actually breaks. Okay, and it actually forms ions. This is the ionic state. And for the ionic state, we need to write an axis. That means these fluid ions are surrounded by the water molecules. Similarly, these calcium ions are actually surrounded by the oxygen of the water molecule. <coughs> You're getting it? So writing these states is, is fairly, very important as well. Okay, so we write down the concentration for calcium. So calcium CA2 plus concentration. Remember that the ratio is 1 is to 1. Look at the concentration for calcium fluoride. We just found here and it is the same as calcium ions. So that's a 2.3. Because the ratio is the same. 2.3 to the power of minus 3 molar. Molarity you can see. And the concentration for F minus. What is the concentration? The concentration is twice. Twice the value of 2.3. So 2.3 into minus 4. And how of it gets? Multiplied by 2. Okay. So this actually gives you 4.6. 4.6 to the power of minus 4. Molar. Okay, so now once you've got the concentrations, then you get to use your KSP uh, expression. So I'll continue here. Your KSP. Okay. Solubility product is equal to the concentration of your CA2 plus. Into the concentration of your F minus. Okay, remember that. Okay, remember that your F minus over here is like your 2F minus and this coefficient is now going to become power. That's the rule that you need to use. If you still recall, if it's actually multiplied by any number, that becomes the power over there. Okay, so it's very important then. Okay, so you write down the concentration for a question. It's a 2.3 to the power of uh, minus 4. And over here is F minus is 4.6 to the power of minus 4. Okay. Following everyone? You can see the slides, isn't that? Uh, are you able to see the slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we use the calculator <coughs> and we get the value for this. Okay, if you do that, you get the value of 4.9. So that's your 4.9 to the power of minus 11. So that's your final answer. With you. Okay, so that's a question number six. You're trying to find the solubility product once the once the concentrations are known for calcium and fluoride ions. Okay, then we're going to look at the next question. Okay, is there enough time? We have there enough time, or shall we stop? <clears throat> we have there enough time for the questions. We left with the three other questions there. Question seven, question eight, question nine, and then question ten. So we left with the four questions there. Do we have enough time or we shall stop in here? Yeah, can we continue? 
Yes, sir. Continue, sir. Continue, sir. Okay, so let's see. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the first one is uh, quite a simple one over here. You need to find the molar solubility of barium sulfate, firstly in the pure water. Okay, and then you're going to find the molar solubility in a salt that is 0.1 molar sodium sulfate. Okay, so to do that, okay, you need to write down the expression for the KSP, but before that, you need to write down the dissociation for your BASO4. Okay, so let's see, BASO4. Know that sparingly soluble salts where they don't eat by ACD, solid, and then it dissociates like that to give you BA2 plus. Let's see, aqueous plus your SO42 minus. <clears throat> Okay, now once you've done that, then you can write down the expression for the KSP. So KSP is equals to BA2 plus concentration. And SO42 minus concentration. <clears throat> maybe what we can do we can just solve this last question here yeah? okay and then we may stop okay and uh, for the remaining questions uh, we can discuss it later on okay so you, you, I've, got, I've given you the email address so you can always ask the questions to me there later on okay now <clears throat> so what is the KSP that's provided to you Okay, here the KSP for BASF4 is already given is 1.0 to the power of minus 10. Okay, so in this particular case, what you're trying to do, you want to find the concentration of BA2 plus, or you also want to find the concentration of SO42 minus. That is known as molar solubility. Molar solubility means to find the concentrations using the KSP given. And the KSP given is 1.0 to the power of minus 10. Okay, so that's given as 1.0 to the power minus 10. Okay, and is equal to, what is the concentration of a BA2 plus? We do not know that, so we say it is X mole. Okay, and what is the con <clears throat> concentration for your S of O2 minus? We do not know that. So we say it is x over here. And then we solve this. So x into x is equal to your, your x squared. Okay, so x squared is equal to 1.0 to the power of 10 to the power minus 10. And then to solve for the x, we take the square root. Okay, so to solve for the x over here, we take the square root of 1.0 to the power of minus 10. 10 to the power minus 10. <clears throat> and this gives the concentration for the BA2 plus, that's your X over here. Okay. And the value is actually <clears throat> 1.0 to the power of minus 5. And look at the unit, you're taking the square root of this particular unit over here. So this is going to become mole and Vm minus 3. So you also have these values. Okay, so 2 becomes 1 and minus 6 becomes minus 3. So that's the concentration for the Va2 plus. And it will be the same as the concentration for the SO4 to minus 6. The ratio is 1 is to 1. Okay, so this solves the first question 
we're finding the concentration <coughs> of the ions in low water. Now the second part is actually the common ion effect. <coughs> look at the common ion over here. This is the S4. And look at the <coughs> common ion over here. This is the S4 over here. And what does the common ion do? Okay. The common ion actually reduces the molar solubility. Okay. So you can try this second part yourself. Let's see. Okay, and I think it's already on time, so we shall stop over here. Maybe I'll just provide you uh, the final answer for your part B. You can try it for part B actually, and you should get your final answer as, as 1.0. To the power of minus 9 mole. So if you compare this value with this particular value over here, <coughs> so, okay. this is minus 5 and this is minus 9. And this comma 9 is actually greatly reduced, okay, the solubility of the SO4 to minus. Okay, so there are some of the other questions left and what you can do if you want the solutions for this, you can always email me. Okay, and we can be in touch over here for not only these questions, if you could do any other questions, okay, feel free, okay, uh, I've already posted my email address into the chat box, so you can always uh, send me an email and then we can actually uh, do the correspondence and we can solve some more of the questions. Okay, so the question number eight is that this was actually on, uh, on the ionic product of water, whether the pressure precipitate will form or not okay and then this was on the Hess's law to find the heat of the reaction and then the question 10 was based on uh, uh, on the electrochemical cell okay by the way you have to find the cell potential writing down the cell rotations okay and I'll find the cathode and the end okay so uh, we'll stop here then okay and uh, your concerns could be raised through the email then. So we will stop here. Thank you for your attendance. Okay, and uh, uh, your attention as well. And all the best for your coming exams. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so thank you, everyone. <laughs>